2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SIGOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. From every point of the globe, welcome to this uh, Secret Pioneer webinar uh, that we have uh, been uh, developing from Secret uh, since uh, a few years ago with a great success. Uh, today, we had the opportunity to see the number nine webinar from the HIP committee, and it's a great uh, pleasure to share with my colleagues from the HIP committee this uh, adventure, organizing these nine webinars this year, and more will come next, next year. So um, I would like to present this uh, new webinar as um, a webinar um, focus in a practical way and uh, we will try during the next hour to clarify the algorithm to manage revision total hip arthroplasty. We will try to do in a very practical way with cases, with pictures, videos, and try to send a very clear message how to manage revision total hip arthroplasty. In this opportunity, we can uh, share the moderation with my friend Huasen Chua from Malaysia. And in the first row, we have the three speakers, Sebastian Hart from Germany, Jebat Parvisi from US, and Asar Merikan from Malaysia. And in the next round, we have the opportunity to see four fantastic speakers presenting very nice cases to illustrate the content of this revision hip arthroplasty. So we'll have Mirnal Sharma from India, Ahmed Adelassin from Egypt, Olga Pitgaiskap from Ukraine, and Mark Tay from Spain. So I hope you will enjoy these uh, talks. The first one will be focused in aseptic loosening of the stem and the cap. The second one will be about septic and we will move to the end of the session. So the second one will be unstable total hip arthroplasty. Then we will move to the first case about um, pain from the femoral side. The next case will be cap loosening. 
Then we will have the next talk by Jay Parvisi about septic loosening. And finally, the two cases about infection and instability. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker from Germany, from the Jarite Institute, Sebastian Hart. So I will try to invite him to share the screen and present the first talk about aseptic loosening, a treatment algorithm. So Sebastian. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, very uh, pleasant to, to represent here the charity and my algorithm for the stem and cup aseptic loosening. Um, we all know uh, it's the yeah, most important reason for revision surgeries. The loosening, it's uh, uh, nearly in every registry, the, the most important fact. And you also know the Poporsky classification, it's based on the acetabular rim and also the cup migration. And we also know that the downgrading of the defect by biological reconstruction showed poor, medium and long-term results. And another problem is that the classification didn't recommend for a specific course of treatment in these cases. So the defect analysis, in my opinion, is very, very important. You have to think about all these um, things, about the things you need for the revision, um, for the surgery, um, and um, uh, yeah, to, um, uh, um, to get the defect uh, or to um, restore the defect. So the Paprosky type 1 defect, it's an anterior posterior on columns um, and the rim remains intact and supportive. Um, you don't have uh, nearly any bone loss and you uh, will get more than 50% of host bone contact. So these cases, um, you can usually use hemispherical cups, perhaps you need some additional screws. Um, and as you can see here, also in the video, you have these spherical defects and when you ream it or you shape it with the, um, uh, the reamer, um, in, a, in a bigger jumbo cup, uh, normally you, you, you will get a, a perfect press fit with these hemispherical cups, like on the right side. The Poporsky type 2A defect, so it's a super medium de medial defect, uh, the superior rim of the acetabulum is still intact, but the defect is evident to the thin superior rim and it's direct superior or superior medial. Usually um, we use, the, in these cases, impaction grafting and then and normally you can also use the hemispherical cups to reconstruct the defects. The type 2B defects, it's also an oval defect, but it's superolateral. So the superacetabular rim is missing and it's just yeah, mm, uh, less than one third of the circumference of the serial rim is the Uh, and then um, some uh, also the hemispherical cups. So it's the, the superior defects where we transfer the oval defects into a spherical defect, and then you can always use these hemispherical cups. So we reconstruct the cranial contact point um, for the defects, and this is possible with these wedges up to 30 millimeters. When uh, it's a bigger defect, then you can use a buttress plate I will show you in the next few slides. This is uh, some uh, intraoperative pictures. You see the reamer and you see the space over it. Um, it's an oval defect and you can put the uh, wedge here and then you have a spherical um, defect when, and you can use the hemispherical cup in these cases like this. And this is what I said before, when you have a defect more than 30 millimeters, you can treat these cases with a buttress plate but um, you always need a posterior approach to place these buttress plate uh, very good. It's an invasive surgery and it really fits, especially in small um, sizes. Type 2C defect, so it's a medial wall defect. The migration of the acetabulum component is medial to the cola line. The teardrop may be obliterate, but the rim is still intact. These cases you can also reconstruct with these hemispherical cups and uh, in this case, uh, graft medial to the cup. This is the bigger uh, type 2C defect um, the medial wall is also defect here. Um, so in these cases, I used uh, a double cup and it cemented dual mobility. You can also use two um, wedges or augments in these cases to reconstruct the uh, rotation center of the hip. 
The superior migration over two centimeter, it's a 3A defect with a moderate teardrop and ischial lysis. The colas line is still intact or just expand a bit to the medial side. The bone loss from, is from nearly 10 to two o'clock. And in these cases, um, you can use also uh, augments and also a graft and the semispherical cups, perhaps an additional screw to the issue. Another uh, three B defect, so it's a migration also over two centimeters, but the colas line is not intact. The bone loss is more; it's from nine o'clock to five o'clock, and the host bone co contact is less than forty percent. In these cases, we always try to use sometimes more augments. The, in this case, it was uh, or the, these are two um, augments and then a cup cage construct, uh, and it's a mended cup in the uh, cup cage construct to reconstruct. Um, these defects. Another problem, Paposki 3B defects, uh, you've seen uh, these with uh, pelvic discontinuity like this case um, and we did these with a half cup cage uh, because of the uh, really bad um, issue uh, bone stock. Uh, I think the, um, it's, it's okay to use just a half cup cage. 3B, as I said before, um, uh, with the super remedial migration more than two centimeters, um, you can use two augments, uh, like a footing augment, where you can put these on the medial side to reconstruct um, uh, the rotation center of the hip. So this is just uh, to, to uh, get an overview how to use these augments uh, and these defects. Type 1, or it's a flying buttress for the superolateral defects. Type 2, it's for me the, the classic type, the dome augment for elliptical acetabulum defects. And uh, as I said on the before, the footing augment where you can use two uh, augments uh, for the medial, uh, for big medial defects, you can use also two cups in these cases. Um, Proposky classification for the femur side, you all know, um, and it's very important that you have a therapy algorithm to avoid further complications. A Proposky type, sorry, Proposky type one defect is just a minimal metaphysical bone defect. We always use standard stems uh, with the distal fixation, like here on the right side. Uh, type 2 defects, it's just an extensive metaphysal defect with a minimal diaphysal defect. We can use revision stems, uh, also distal fixation stem, but just a bit longer. Paposki type 3A defect, it's more than 4 centimeters of an intact diaphysal fixation length. Um, we Nowadays, we use or we try to use more monoblock revision stems. But in these cases, sometimes you have uh, to use modular stems, like in this case. Um, perhaps I would do this nowadays uh, with a monoblock stem. Um, and uh, 3B defects, it's less than 4 centimeters of an intact diaphysal fixation. We usually use modular revision stems, sometimes cemented distally if it's necessary. In this case, it's uh, for sure, it's, yeah, <laughs> I hope it's, but it will heal. It was a patient nearly 95 years old, um, and we did an uncemented stem here. Um, in our opinion, it's necessary to have two centimeters of isthmus contact um, for enough stabilization. Popovsky type 4 defects, so it's a meta and diaphysal defects without sufficient isthmus. Here have nearly three uh, treatment options. You can do an impaction bone grafting and a cemented stem distally cemented and approximal cementless, or you can, in, so, in very severe cases, do, to, uh, do a total femur. In this case, we give it a try and we did this um, uh, off-label, uncemented distal um, stem where we put some cement in um, and put a strut graft on the, on the lateral side on the femur to uh, avoid some bigger problems um, here. Another case uh, was a young patient where we did uh, impaction bone grafting, um, and then a cemented cup, uh, cemented stem, I'm sorry, and the strut graft also in this um, case. So let me summarize. You need a mechanical stable construct. You have to avoid for the bone loss in these cases. Um, you should achieve maximal host bone contact, um, and especially with these uh, new implants with high biological ingrowth potential. And I would say nearly 95% of these cup revisions you can treat with these modular cup systems. From the femur side, you should stay short as possible and as long as necessary. 
and also impaction grafting uh, on the like on the last slide and cemented restorage are good alternatives but because of the time i didn't show you some cases for this thank you thank you so much sebastian and while we were waiting for uh, sharing the screen of the next speaker american thank you so much for this great summary uh, management of this uh, aseptic loosening so can you stop sharing and then Professor American will, will talk now about uh, the treatment algorithm for unstable uh, total hip replacement. Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. So I've been asked to talk about uh, my thoughts on the unstable hip and how to deal with these. And as you all know, uh, it's a complex interplay of many factors, patient factors, surgical factors, and implant factors. And uh, ironically, revision itself will cause, uh, has got an increased risk of instability. But if you try and simplify it to a very mechanistic uh, kind of point of view, it's either the, the ball is being pushed out, being levered out, uh, of the cup uh, or the femoral head is not being strapped in adequately with uh, soft tissues. So if you have improper component alignment, uh, the neck of the femur component will impinge on the plastic and it will uh, lever out. Or in other cases, you, know, you can have bony impingement by the trochanter or in, in less commonly uh, impingement of uh, retained osteophytes. So... Um, in the soft tissues tension part, you can see that if uh, the feet, the soft tissues are not drawn out to length, they cannot be an effective restraint for the stability of the hip. Uh, but in essence, really, it's an interplay between these factors and you cannot separate one from the other. Uh, they go hand in hand. Component position, offset length, orientation of the component and the soft tissue tension. Uh, for example, if you just look at femoral offset per se, uh, of course, it has got an effect on abductor function, but in the context of dislocation, not only it brings out the soft tissue out to length uh, and it stabilizes the hip, but it draws the femur away from the pelvis. And so it's less likely for you to impinge implant or implant or bone and bone. So really your, your remit is to try and, uh, and find the cause or causes which have caused the instability. And if it's an improper implant alignment, obviously the correct implant alignment, if there's a source of impingement to remove the impingement, and it's a problem with soft tissue tension, either to restore the soft tissue tension with bony work or with soft tissue work. So let's just look at the uh, sort of appropriate solutions. So if the cut, if the head is being levered out uh, and it's due to improper implant alignment, it's because the improper implant alignment is causing impingement of the prosthesis. So to correct the implant alignment, removing the source of impingement is an obvious uh, strategy and trying to improve on your jump distance and the head neck ratio and getting a better uh, impingement-free movement with a dual mobility would be uh, the solution to this problem. And then again, as I explained earlier on, to increase the offset to take the femur away from the, from the uh, pelvis to uh, prevent impingement. And with soft tissue tension, you can either restore the soft tissue tension by um, reconstructing the greater trochanter or advancing it or increasing the offset and, and, and vertical offset or length or in some cases, uh, when you're desperate, you might have to resort to a constraint cup. This is quite a buzz for, um, or rather quite a topical topic for instability. And you can see that in a normal spinal pelvic relationship, as you go from stand to sitting, your low dosis straightens up and the pelvis tilts backwards and the cup now faces forward so that it prevents impingement on the front of the cup. And so it's a coupled movement and really the spine and the hip work together to get this combined range of motion. And if you like, it's the ultimate dual mobility. Uh, it's a motion of the spine and the hip which will contribute to the overall motion. And obviously, if you have pathology which causes a stiff spine, then in this case, you can see that uh, the spine looks the same whether the patient stands or sits and the cup doesn't uh, roll forward. So you've got impingement of the, of the stem on the front of the cup here. And then this causes a leverage and dislocation. So the solution then is not so much to use constraint, but to try to improve on this uh, or to get rid of this impingement. Now, in, in this case, you might want to increase the antiversion, but one of the more obvious solutions would be to use a larger head or to use the dome mobility and not so much constraint. 
in this particular case of mine, it looks as if there might be a very bad soft tissue problem. And it does look like a very difficult revision because there's a lot of uh, cement all the way down the canal and very little bone. But if you really looked at the um, problem uh, more critically and you use a CT and reconstruct it in three dimension, and this is the end on view from the end of the femur looking down the, the femur towards the femoral head, and you can see a very large antiversion. And obviously this will cause the hip to dislocate anteriorly. So here I was a, little, a bit able to cheat a little bit. I did not have to do a complete revision. I did a dry revision. I basically adjusted the, the shell, um, really adjusted the liner on the shell, cemented the liner to an existing shell and used a conventional liner, liner and put it in the correct orientation and reduced that very excessive antiversion of the femoral stem. And although it looks rather precarious and it looks like it might dislocate tomorrow from impingement, it stood the test of time and it's now seven years post-operatively and the patient is still uh, has a stable hip. This is the other scenario. So if you look at this particular patient, uh, the cup looks okay. The, um, the uh, offset, if you look at the distance from the trochanter to the uh, lesser trochanter, it looks fairly adequate. A CT scan shows that the cup opening and the antiversion is within normal limits. Uh, and so it's a little bit uh, mysterious why she dislocates. We took her to have some dynamic imaging. And if you can see that we move the hip around and it's not a problem with impingement, but when you pull on it axially, and you can see that probably the soft tissues are not adequate enough to keep the hip within this place. So in this particular scenario, it's not so much this is the problem, but really you have to think of how you're going to restore soft tissue tension, either by advancing the greater trochantering or to increase offset by adjusting the femur uh, or, the, or the neck of the head or to increase the length of the femur to increase that soft tissue tension. And in some scenarios, like in this particular case, the lateral shock just looks quite excessive. You might have to resort to a constrained cut. And I don't think in this particular scenario, a dome mobility will, will help you very much, but um, it's possible that large head and dome mobility will, will help you a little bit because uh, that will uh, help to improve the jump distance. So this is a quite common algorithm. If you have an early dislocation, you can pray and reduce it. Hopefully it doesn't uh, re-dislocate. If it dislocates more than three times, then it's quite likely to become recurrent. Um, if you have a late dislocation, then it's quite one of the possible causes of wear or neurology or muscle problem. And then you might have to use to a constraint. In this particular case, the patient had an adverse metal reaction after 20 years of metal metal implant. And it was both a problem with wear and also a problem with the abductor muscle. So a constraint liner was cemented into the existing shell. So initially, look for sources of um, dislocation on the X-ray, whether it be X-ray, CT scan, EOS, or dynamic imaging. If there's an impingement problem, you have to remove the impingement. Here, obviously, on the right side, there's a problem with offset and length. You have to revise the femur. And if there's a malposition of the established cup, then usually you have to revise the established cup. But if it's a very minor malposition, then you might be able to get away with using a face changing liner. And certainly use a large hit, largest hit as possible. But sometimes in Asia, the large cup may be a bit of an issue. And if the, in this case, a recurrent dislocation where the imaging uh, does not show an obvious cause and you think that the implants are all in good position, then one of the possible suspects is the spine or uh, the soft tissue uh, problem. So in the case of spine, uh, if it's a problem with positioning, then you may need to adjust the cup positioning. But usually if it's a stiff spine, then uh, one of the uh, common uh, solution will be a dome mobility cup. In the case of the soft tissues, if there's an abductor dysfunction, like I said before, you have to improve on the offset, either advance the trochanter, use a longer neck, um, and also you have the possibility of using an uh, eccentric liner to improve on the offset. Um, obviously, if the trochanter is broken to bits, then you've got to repair these. Uh, I repaired this with a technique described by the Koreans, and uh, you, in this particular case, I use a constraint cup to protect that repair, and uh, trochanter fixation protects the constraint cup and, and vice versa. So if um, there's abductor insufficiency, particularly if it's an elderly, low demand uh, with neurology, then your um, constraint cup will be a very good bailout card. So in summary, uh, look critically at the imaging, but don't forget that intra assessment is actually very important. Once you put in the trial components, check the lateral shock, and the axle shark. Uh, this will help you to identify the cause and address them. First and foremost, correct implant malposition. 
use a large head to um, optimize femoral head neck ratio, uh, optimize on the femoral offset because this will prevent impingement and also will help you to optimize soft tissue tension. A dual mobility will be useful when you have a, a stiff spine or when you're unable to use a large head and constraint cups uh, may be necessary in these situations. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor American. It was a great summary of this very interesting topic. Can you stop sharing the screen and then uh, we will have the next speaker ready. Uh, we have the great honor to present um, Professor Parvisi that will uh, talk uh, about one topic that he never talks about. He will, he will talk about uh, septic loosening. So um, uh, Dr. Parvisi now is, uh, is, is doing a, a presentation in another Congress. So it's a great pleasure. Uh, Jay, you stay with us here from Thank the SICO. Thank so you very, you. thank you very, very much, Oliver, and thank you all of you for uh, uh, your patience while I was trying to get off the meeting. I'm in Romania, so I've been given the task of talking about my algorithm for management of chronic infection, basically. I apologize for the noise in the background. It looks like Romanians love their radio and there's a lot of music, so hopefully if you don't take anything away from my talk, you will at least enjoy the music in the background. So first, what is definition of chronic PJI? We need to make sure that we have a definition for it. Most of us in the US and there are some parts of the world rely on the ICM criteria. And as you can see here, the chronic and acute have different parameters, both for serum and for synovial uh, biomarkers that we measure. And I'm sure you all of you know that uh, the chronic both the ESR and CRP is elevated, self counts greater than 3,000 and PMM percentage also higher. Chronic is basically the infection is more than four weeks from index arthroplasty. There's a sinus tract, and by that definition, there's an established bifold. So the first is that the results of treating chronic PJI is not fantastic. At the, in the best hands, it's probably about 80 to 85% successful. The question is, what do we do to try to make this? better. The first is that we have to optimize the patient. That in itself is a whole talk, which I don't have time to go into, but we must make sure that the patient's malnutrition is addressed, diabetes is taken care of, patients are not smokers, etc. all of that. And the options available really is one stage versus two stage. And patients who fail in those patients, we obviously rely on uh, salvage operations. This this uh, there is a there's an ongoing uh, enthusiasm towards the use of one stage exchange. I've actually used one stage exchange immensely on a lot of other patients, and this is uh, mostly thanks to endoclinic work that has provided us guidance on to when to do the one stage exchange. And the one stage exchange is a fantastic operation because there's only one operation, and uh, there is no period of. Um, uh, disability or inability to function uh, between the two stages. But it is not a good option for patients who have severe soft tissue defect, so you can't close. If they have severe bone loss that requires megaprosthesis and a lot of other work, and the procedure is high. And then, of course, the patient is systemically sick, you just want to do a quick operation, reduce bio burden, and then come back at a later date. Now, the last point here, culture negative PJI, this was discussed during the consensus, and I am pretty sure this particular contraindication is going to be removed in the next consensus because Tom Faring, that's running the uh, one stage versus two stage study in the US, brought to us the fact that culture negatives actually do just as well as the culture positives. And uh, culture negative, in my hands, is not a contraindication to one stage exchange. But that's in the consensus document, and I have a feeling that will change next time. Uh, success based on literature is really pretty much the same, and I'm not going to go through that too much. But I'm sure you, all of you know about the informed trial. Yeah, the informed trial wasn't based on outcome because obviously that would require thousands of patients like we've come to realize in the U.S. But nonetheless, it didn't see a difference in outcome when you look at it. And there was no cherry picking here. Everybody that had a chronic PJI was uh, was randomized to one stage versus two stage. And not surprisingly, one stage exchange is cheaper. So who do I do want to stage on? Everybody except the patients in whom I can't close the wound. If they have massive bone loss that requires megaprosthesis 
And that clinical trial that we have right now ongoing in the United States that Tom Ferring presented both at the hip and the knee society. We're waiting for the two year follow up, and I believe that will get published next year. Does not see culture negative as a contraindication to one stage. Oh, yeah. One other point. We keep hearing on the podium from a lot of these authorities that you need to be able to deliver antibiotics and cement. We do not do cemented hip revisions in the United States. And many of us who've done one stage without the use of cement have not seen a difference in outcome. So I don't believe that in itself was a contraindication either. But more of that to come. So I'm not, I don't have enough time to go through it. But first, you have to make sure you use the right incision. Most of these patients have multiple incisions. You must make sure you do aggressive and extensive debridement. Um, I would do a full synovectomy, as George Searney used to say, uh, operating on an infected case is like operating on tumor, and you need to get clean margins. So I don't use a ronjor. I actually use a uh, sharp dissection, get extensive synovectomy, and a whole pocket of soft tissue has to come out. And it's very, very important to make sure that you're actually um, using the superficially. You're also doing uh, good dissections to get relaxation of the soft tissues. Take your time and use a bovi, sharp dissection, whatever else. Before you get to the implants, this is actually just during the dissection that takes a huge amount of work. Then, of course, you will remove the implants. And then once you've done the explantation, I would inter, um, I would use intramedullary reaming in the presence of antiseptic solution. The antiseptic solution I like is povidine iodine, but you can use others, in particular, Dakin solution, which is 0.125% uh, hypochlorite. That is also fantastic. You have to be very patient to remove these implants without taking too much um, of the bone. So patience is really, really important. Once you remove the implants, you gain access to the posterior capsule. In the knee, for example, you must make efforts to try to really do further debridement of the posterior capsule, cleaning up the intermedullary. And then I have a chemical uh, debridement. So you've done the mechanical debridement. Now I do a chemical debridement which includes using the 4% CHG scrub. This is the thing that we use our wash our hands prior to surgery. I will use that to scrub the soft tissues and the surface of the implants. This is 4% chlorhexidine. The, the commercial irrigation solution that's available in the US is 0.05%. So I'm talking about a 4% scrub. I use Dakin solution, as I mentioned, and particularly when you're doing intermodulary reaming. I use a half a percent hydrogen peroxide, but very quickly you remove that. It will show you any necrotic tissues that may be left behind. And then I use a half a percent PVPI irrigation solution. And sometimes I leave that behind in the intermedullary canal before I use the cement spacer. And then I change to a new setup and then reimplantation starts. And with the reimplantation, we usually use antibiotic impregnated cement if we are using cement. But as I said, in the hips, we don't uh, use cement. Postoperatively, the length of antibiotic treatment should really be determined by your infectious disease doctor, but minimum of six to eight weeks for the one stage. Two stage, if the culture comes back as positive, you need to treat them with six to eight weeks of oral versus intravenous. If it doesn't, based on the studies, we give them three months of, uh, of oral antibiotic for the suppression. So how is a two-stage done? That's basically the, uh, the, the way it's done. Now, in terms of spacer, if you're doing a two-stage, people ask spacer and what antibiotics I use. So I prefer to use dynamic spacer whenever I can, but sometimes you can use dynamic spacer because, and I'll tell you who they are. I usually decide on the amount of antibiotics based on four factors. One, which organism caused the infection. Two, patient's renal clearance and their impairment. Three, which cement I'm using, because not all cements are created equal. Some cements elude the antibiotics better than the others. So if you use too much antibiotics, patient can develop systemic toxic toxicity. And then four, the amount of antibiotic, the amount of cement spacer, whether you're going to use two packets, three packets, four packets, you have to be careful because the cumulative dose of antibiotics will be too high. I like to make my own, um, my own spacers. 
And this is how I do. I sort of do a sandwich thing, a monomer, then the powder, because you're adding so much antibiotics that sometimes if you add that, you can't mix it very well. So this is how I mix it. And then obviously I will uh, fashion and then time doesn't allow me to go into it. Now, static spacer is a good idea for patients who have precarious soft tissues and you want to immobilize them. Patients who have extensive bone loss in whom putting a dynamic spacer is going to lead to further bone loss, fracture, or dislocation. And patients who have ligamentous instability in whom the dynamic spacer is going to dislocate, I would not use a tent. I do hand mixing of the spacers, uh, increases the porosity, increases antibiotic illusion. We showed you some of that. And then finally, who's a candidate for repeat two-stage exchange? Um, tough question, because the results of repeat two-stage exchange is not as great as the, um, the first time. And even the results of the first time is not fantastic. So I would only repeat it for patients in whom the first two-stage exchange was not done either properly or the patient was not optimized. Something that I can do differently this time uh, that was not done first time, that would be my indication for a repeat two-stage exchange. If there isn't anything new I will be doing for the patient, I would not subject the patient to another round of two-stage exchange. And in these patients, I would go with resection, arthroplasty, or amputation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jay. It was a fantastic talk about infection. And, and then um, we will have like a few minutes for some questions. So um, we have some questions from the from the audience. So um, Dr. American, there is a question about how to manage these spinopelvic parameters. I mean, there are many papers published about that, but you did a great uh, conclusion. Use dual mobility. So <laughs> what do you think? Uh, are there any comments about the spinal pelvic parameters to influence the position of the acetabulum and the femur? Or do you think just in case you have any concern, use it dual mobility cups? What do you think? Yeah. Um, so with spinal pelvic, you have position and mobility. Yeah, so... One is you can you can look at the uh, X-rays uh, lateral view, standing and sitting, and work out whether there's enough motion. So in an, uh, I know there's a whole bunch of numbers, but just look at one parameter, say the sacral slope. Um, the sacral slope changes from about twenty to forty. So thirty is like the cutoff point, right? So if you have a sacral slope of twenty, then you're sort of stuck sitting, and you're standing, uh, stuck standing, then your your sacral slope is more than thirty. That's just a rough guide. But if your sacral slope changes by less than, than 20 degrees, then you've got a quite a stiff spine. And in that case, I think I'll use a dome mobility. Try to, to maximize offset and use a dome mobility because your so-called um, uh, safe zone is very small. So if you use a dome mobility, that will, that will help you. Now, if you have a mobile spine, but you have problems with the position, uh, so now you're mobile spine, but uh, the pelvis is not, the position of the pelvis is not the right position, then you may have to work out what antiversion will be good for that particular uh, scenario, which I guess is it's not that easy. So that particular patient um, where you have, uh, say, stuck sitting, uh, uh, then it, when he stands up, right, he will dislocate posteriorly. Right, because it will impinge uh, anteriorly. So here you may want to increase the antiversion. So that will be roughly what uh, what will be done. And sometimes, uh, very rarely, I got one case where um, it's a combination, again, it's a combination of factors. So uh, I one have one case where when the patient lies down, which is okay, but when she stands up, there's a listesis, which then causes the pelvis to, to, to turn um, abnormally. So here I, I use uh, an increased offset uh, and I got the spine surgeons to correct the spine as well. And uh, I did not use a dome mobility. So in some situations, you might not, you might be able to uh, get away from dome mobility. But I, I think if you're going to use constraint, you have to be a little bit careful. I think it may fail. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, Sebastian, there is another question from Brazil. One attendee from there asked you a question about when you plan this surgery from the X-rays or from the CT about the bone defect, 
and uh, you yeah. and you plan the surgery like that. Uh, when you remove the component, the size of the defect sometimes is much bigger. So, any comment on that? Is this classification useful intraoperative or not? The I think the classification is not not useful intraoperatively. You you can um, think about it before you go on the surgery. What could happen? We do a CT scan um, and the big defects. Um, but uh, this is I think the the it makes my life uh, much more easier. You have this uh, modular component where you can use um, I don't know you can use three or uh, sometimes four augments to reconstruct these defects. So you have really, as I said before, 90% of these cases you can you can handle with the, these modular system. Um, but you should have everything in house. This is <laughs> the first important thing. So um, uh, beware, beware uh, when you don't have these uh, all this stuff uh, in the house. Um, but but um, yeah, just in a in a few cases, we we need a CT scan before. And just in very 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 big uh, defects, we do the um, uh, individual implants, um, uh, and uh, we don't use uh, this modular cup system. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, Jay. There is a question from an uh, attendee from Philippines. And the question is, the new fashion is one stage revision in total hip replacement. Do you think in the future, 90% of our cases will be done with one stage? Great question, Oliver. I don't know the percentage, but I can tell you and share with you three facts. One is that we are paying more attention to one stage exchange. Thanks to, again, the Europeans and Shaoli from China and others who've been pioneers of one-stage exchange. So more and more surgeons, including the young ones, are embracing one-stage exchange. Two, and thanks to research being done by the informed trial, as well as Tom Faring in the U.S., we will have data to show us whether the one-stage exchange and two-stage exchange has a different outcome. But more importantly, perhaps give us indicate indicators of who the good or ideal candidates for one stage exchange are. And then the third, I think that the economics of medicine is going to most likely push some people towards the one stage exchange. And I'm not saying that's the right thing, obviously, but that's what happens. So, yes, the answer is absolutely. There will be more and more of one stage exchange. If you ask me, Four years ago, whether I would do one stage exchange, I would say, no, I can't. I don't know the data. I don't know how to do it, et cetera. Now, about 60 to 70% of my cases are one stage exchange. In fact, I'm doing a one stage exchange tomorrow in Barcelona. So there, there is one stage exchange for sure. And I think we will be seeing many, many more one stage exchange. And in doing so, we will become better in doing one stage exchange because Again, the technique of how you do it is also critical, thanks to, again, Thorsten Gurk and Faris Haddad and Shao Li and others that give these lectures continuously. So sorry for the long answer. It may not be 90%, but it'll be close. Great. Thank you so much. And one last question to this block is also for you, Jay. I mean, what is your bet for the diagnostic tool in the future? Just say one thing in a very short replay. What is your? Uh, it's still synovial fluid, sending it for cell count and neutrophil differential seems to work just as good as anything else. But there will be one point of care test that you can do very quickly and gives you the answer in one minute. I'm conflicted because we're working on that diagnostic too. I'm sorry about that. You are conflicting. <laughs> Maybe we will see in the future. So th thank you so much. Uh, uh, we will continue with the cases. So keep there the, the experts for the discussion. And we will move to the net, the first case by Mirnal Sharma that we talk about pains comes from the femur. So Mirnal, share your screen and present your case and we will have some questions for the experts. Thank you, Mirnal, for the idea. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Ahead, thank please. you. Thank you, Seacord, and thank you, Oliver. So my revision case would be uh, pain coming from the femoral stem. And uh, this is my hospital where I work. So this is a patient 
who comes to who is 50 years old and he comes to me uh, with pain and limp shortening of the left lower limb his right hip was done 12 years ago and the left hip was done 10 years ago he complains of start up pain and uh, thigh pain uh, more so and he has been walking on this for quite a long time now and this is how he presents to me. You can see uh, that the right hip is uh, sitting well, but the left hip, you can see the whole of the stem has actually uh, migrated into the canal and it's loose and it's almost ready to dislocate and it's sunk in. So the first thing which came to my mind was probably this is, uh, he's got infection. So this pain was gradually increasing for the past one year. It was not an acute onset. There was no history of any fever of UTI. He was not an immunocompromised patient. The CBC was within normal limits, ESR 38, CRP 2.8. But this void, if you see, I marked it with the red circle. I had a high index of suspicion that it might be infected. So we did an ultrasound guided aspiration. The fluid showed no growth of any aerobic, anaerobic, fungal or tubercle growths, even at six weeks. The gram stain, AFB stains did not show any bacteria and the gene expert was negative. So tuberculosis is very endemic in our part of the country, but still uh, nothing grew here. So I thought how to manage this. So the basic management would be like get a CT scan, delineate the defects, get a Mars MRI to see if it's aseptic, classify the defect, what approach to be used, single stage or a two stage might be needed, revise both the components and what would be my, what would be my implant choice in such cases. So Mina, the MRI, yeah. Mina, can, you, can, we, can we ask Jay about that? Because you present many uh, infectious disease parameters for the diagnosis of this case that it looks like infected in the x-ray. So, Jay, any comment on the, the diagnostic lab test yeah, that I, they use? I, I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with you, Oliver, that it does. this looks very, very suspicious for infection, in my opinion. Again, parameters may have been missed. But as you know, there are some um, organisms, slow-growing organisms that don't elicit by inflama inflammatory response, and uh, they can they can be missed. The reason here is that that the area of focal osteolysis on the cortex that's a little worrisome. That's always a sign of infection. So, what I would do here, I would treat this like an infection, and I would take intraoperative cultures. I would be inclined to even change the astabulum. Changing the astabulum is not very hard, but you don't have to. But I would treat this as an infection. Yes. So, Mirna, this is the, this is the advice from Jay Parvisi. So, what did you do? I mean, you asked for MRI. Right? Yeah. So, this MRI scan did not show much of collection inside, and uh, it did not actually. In the report, also did not uh, you know point towards infection. So, uh, I was obviously prepared for a two stage exchange, and I went when I went inside. You know, I sent the histopathological examination, and uh, even they could not find much polymorphonucleus. In, uh, in more than five high power fields. And this is the stem. It came out very easily. You can see that the this is an uncemented stem where, you know, the actual, the coating has actually delimited and the stem became loose. But why it became loose after so many years, we uh, didn't have the answer still. So after let me, I... Yeah, let me ask, let me ask Sebastian. Sorry, Menal. Yeah, uh, Sebastian, no problems. I mean, you, you have talked about the aseptic loosening in, your, in, in this webinar. And, but you work in Charité, so what do you think? Is aseptic, septic? What, what do you think about that? I would still think about aseptic loosening um, because also of the x-ray, and I, I would go, uh, like Dr. Parisi or Professor Parisi said, I, I would exchange both just to be sure and uh, get some interoperative um, um, uh, probe, and we, we will do a sonication. Uh, of these implants, and uh, perhaps uh, we find the answer there. So, yeah, you know, two per yeah. se infection. So, <laughs> yeah, so continue? even I had a suspicion, but when I went inside, I did not find any bad granulation tissue. You know, I could uh, manage to put in a uh, 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 porous coated stem, and I came out. I didn't find any uh, bad tissue there, although I sent it for histopathological examination also. And surprisingly, it did not show any growth of culture even up to four to six weeks. So I couldn't find a bug probably. It might have might have been a low-grade infection, but that is how I came out. The cup was also, you know, very sitting very well. Um, I am still following up with this patient and he's not come back for any loosening or infection to me. But uh, I think what my suspicion was, everyone is suspic sus suspicioning actually the same that it might be infected. 
so you know this is how i managed this case but um, we should always have a, you know um, a high index of suspicion for infection in such cases probably and, and uh, all, you know yeah. as they say it's always good to be pleasantly surprised than the other way around so you did the right thing here and yeah there are some aseptic cases that mimic infection it looks like you did the right thing for the patient obviously this is beautifully done um but i think the message is that we must always suspect infection and treat the patient as if they have an infection and if we are pleasantly surprised great both good for us and for the patient i think we we need to follow the algorithm and if the patient still doesn't fit into that and do what is best you feel um, and if there is a slight suspicion go for a two stage revision that is what i would probably would have done uh, so i had similar cases in my career initially also where this this is a stem loosening on the, and this cemented stem i did a revision very easily it came out this is how i revised it another case you know this is also like showing a lot of voids this is almost after 16 years of the first surgery so all these cases you know this had huge defects and i had reconstructed with a long fully porous coated stem used some allografts and the patients are still doing well so thinking about all those cases which i had done earlier and those also showed voids and i was always uh, clinically had a suspicion of infection still i could manage to do well so in in our part actually infection is the most commonest cause of revisions in total hip and then comes a septic loosening and the commonest cause is failure to incorporate probably in this case it was a mechanical loss of fixation and uh, osteolysis leading to more lysis because the patient kept walking on that and the stem sunk in and uh, even the osteo joint registry swedish joint registry they all tell that uh, aseptic loosening is one of the commonest causes of revisions across the globe and the pathogens is very clear that the wear particles generated activate the macrophages and the uh, lymphocytes and the osteoclastic activity causes the loosening and loss of bone and the implant gets uh, loosened so this is a recent paper on to published in journal of arthroplasty 2022 it says that how do you diagnose and detect subtle aseptic loosening so go for a history acute history may be infection parameters raised rule out infection serial radiographs over loosening a mars mri fdg pet scan showing increased uptake would all point towards uh, aseptic loosening uh there are certain host factors which are responsible for aseptic loosening uh, this study uh, published in corr showed that uh, Uh, they studied 16 uh, you know studies in 4 5 7 7 9 hips and they showed that male sex and high activity level especially the ucla uh, scores more than 8 had a high factor of aseptic loosening in such patients so they wanted them to refrain from high uh, contact sports but they did not find any association with obesity and tobacco abuse so uh, aseptic loosening can be seen a similar case has been reported in history where they've shown aseptic loosening and the debonding and disappearing of the coating and after 4 years after you know the index surgery so this was one of the cases i also you know referred to when i uh, did this surgery and ultimately thank god still now the patient has not got infected but you should always have a high index of suspicion look at both ends of the picture and so that you are not confused intraoperatively and be prepared for everything so i would conclude that do a good preoperative workout uh, rule out infection be prepared for a two stage in case of uh, a dilemma and prepare to revise both components on table if you find that uh, you know there is a loosening um, thank you thank you thank you mirnal so would you can kind of stop sharing the screen and yeah. let's move to the next case uh, ahmed adrasim from egypt i mean the place where we are going to uh, to to do our next congress in in cairo so uh, he's from there i mean he will present us is the cap loose so ahmed please yeah uh, thank you oliver uh, so let me go for the sake of the time immediately to the case so uh, we're where we, this case presented for uh, to me in april 2016 okay uh, she's a female 63 years old at that age uh, no comorbidities uh, uh, overweight she had this cemented bipolar after a fractured neck of femur 2 years ago and now she's complaining of painful hip with limited range of motion and infection has been ruled out so uh, what i did that i was expecting 
an erosion of the the uh, the bone guys with the, the metal head together with a problem in the stem and i went inside uh, i did this operation so in april 2016 i used the lateral approach uh, intraoperative i checked the defect in the acetabulum it was a combined cav- uh, segmental and a cavitary defect the stem was stable so i Uh, left the stem in place. I took a posterior iliac crest with a mixed a mixed it with a synthetic bone defect. I put a mesh, a mesh uh, converting the segmental defect, covering the 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 lost segment, and then impaction grafting with vancomycin. And I used cemented cup, a forty three cup, and an an X long metal head twenty two because the cup was small. So this is my operation that I did. In 2016, yeah. Get, yes. mean, can we can we ask the experts? I mean, Sebastian. Um, okay. It was a great surgery. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? You use you have present a lot of metal to cover the defect. So, what do you think about this option? True. I think these are the the um, there are good literature, and it's uh, it's also a possibility in our hands. These um, augments are working very very well, and when you ask me. I can't remember an aseptic loosening of these augments um, and of these implants. So in our hands, we, we we use it very, very often. But in younger patients, I've, how old is she? 63. It's also an option uh, to do these biological reconstructions of these defects. Sure. So, uh, Sebastian, what what's, what uh, type of defect do you think is are here in the acetabulum? Because... It's the same and, as we asked before. I mean, yeah. As he said before, it's a combined defect. No? It's, it's a segmental defect and a carrier de- de- defect. So this is this is the reality. The classification is uh, uh, is uh, yeah. Uh, it's not always uh, the same in the OR uh, when you have these patients. It's often a combined defect. Um, so uh, yeah, this I think it's. It's not more than two centimeters, so it's a two, uh, probably two B defect. Yeah. So yeah, in the in the OR, always everything is bigger, right? <laughs> um, uh, so Jay, uh, one question about that: uh, uh, they they add vancomycin to the bone to the impaction grafting. Any comment on that? Is that useful? What do you think about that? Using I vancomycin. Think, yeah. Yeah, Heinz Winkler's work on doing vancomycin impregnated graft, whether it's cancellous or cortical, has been pretty promising. So I don't think there is any harm in trying to deliver antibiotics locally, but I can see the the rationale behind your question, and that is vancomycin, does that elude well? And if it does, what activity does it have? It's limited activities, limited activity against the virus A. I mean, I think it's in these infected cases, doing that practice is not a bad idea. Uh, we just hope it works. Let's see. Can you go ahead, Ahmed? Okay. So that was the x-rays two months after the operation. Uh, and in in August, uh, I, I started weight-bearing, uh, thinking that the uh, graft was taken and everything was stable, the, the construct was stable. So I started full weight bearing at August 2016, three months after the operation. Uh, and after maybe five months after the weight bearing, I asked for a CT scan just to confirm the, 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 the uptake of the graft. And this is, was the CT scan, the anterior cut, the middle cut, and the posterior cut. Okay. So, in October 2018, so just after this CT scan was one year, she presented with pain in the buttocks. What will you do? And this is the x-rays. This is the x-rays in 2018. I put this option in front of you. Just uh, yes. if... Uh, we can ask the participants to participate with us. I mean, yeah, Sebastian, what do you think? What option do you choose? A, B, C, or D? So you're you're muted, Sebastian. 
I'm sorry. Can you can you do the X-ray before again for me? And how is the patient? Just the CT scan. Yeah. Okay, and this is now. Uh, and the pain of the patient in the buttocks, in the in the posterior thigh. So this is the X-rays. This is the CT scan, and this is the new X-ray. Two years after the operation. <laughs> can, can I just ask this? Is the cup now looking a little bit more open? And on the inferior part of the cup, has the cement yeah, debonded from the inferior part? Yeah, this is yeah. what I thought about. So let me let me show you this. This is the 2016. Yeah. Yeah, um, Ahmed, I mean, the people from the audience said that um, one third say conservative treatment, one third it's time to revise the stem, and one third the cap is loose and need immediate revision. That's it. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of having a sequential x-rays, okay? Uh, that's, that's, that's what I want to present in this case, that in 2016, the cup was 45 degrees, maybe in 2018 started to... And at that time, I, I thought... Uh, in in 2018, I said that it's co we will go conservative. I see some motion, but I'm not sure. But when I uh, waited to uh, 2019, you can check the how the cup moved to be a, ver a vertical position. So this is the sequence of failure. So 2016, 45 degrees, maybe almost 90 degrees of vertical 2019, and that means that a failure. So amazing. And what did you do? So that's the next question. This is the, the sequence of failure. And that's the next question. What will you do now? So audience can, can vote, but uh, American, what do you do? A, wait and see, revision, the graph and the semantic cap, revision with cementless mega cap, augmentation, or cementless allograph augmentation. American, any option? Why uh, people is voting? Uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes when these fail, uh, the biological reconstruction may have helped you to restore the bone stock. And he's used quite a small cup, 43. Uh, surprisingly, with a 22 hit, uh, it didn't dislocate um, for a revision. I guess it's a soft tissue tension. The cup was a little bit high and the, the, the stem is a little bit high uh, too. Um, I thought there was more... Um, as, uh, what do you call this, uh, cortical hypertrophy at the tip of the stem. I thought that was going to be the source of the pain, but um, it doesn't look like this loosening of the stem. So I will probably revise the cup with a uh, uncemented cup, uh, a big uncemented cup. Uh, provided it's interesting, that, your comment. I mean, it's very, it, yeah. yeah, it's very surprising to, to see this uh, thickness of the diaphysis of the cortical there in this cemented stem. So something is what's happening there biomechanically. So can you go forward, Ahmed? What do you do? So this is the CT scan to help you to choose the the. Ta I'm sure that uh, there is a multiple school uh, schools, uh, uh, multiple uh, choices. But what I did for the sake of time that I went again lateral approach. I removed the the stem this time, uh, so that I have a better uh, field or a better. Uh, view of the cup uh, i started cutting and removal of the broken mesh uh, leaving the posterior part which is where i cannot uh, get it from the lateral approach uh, i used the strut allograft uh, fixed uh, with lag screw and an anti-gliding plate and then i placed a big cementless cup 54 uh, line to line with a metal head which was 36 uh, and uh, i go with the cement cement and cement cpt stem size two, a narrow one. And that's the x-rays post-operative. Great, great. I mean, I mean, audience thought the same as you. <laughs> 100% uh, will decide this uh, semelless cap and, and some kind of uh, graph there. So yeah, this is the, fin the final slide. Yes, this, is, this is, yes, this is 2019. And then I, I will show you, uh, that's the four years follow up till now. Everything is stable, the cup is taken. Uh, no more pain, 
uh, the patient is happy and that's 20, 20, 20, 21 follow-up case. And till now she's following. Last August, she was visiting me and she was doing fine. So my conclusion is that early detection of the cup loosening signs is challenging. The cheapest and the easiest and the most accurate is a comparison of sequential radiograph. They will tell you a lot instead of CT and doing a lot of stuff that may be much expensive. Or let me say. Thank you so much. A fantastic case. So uh, amazing and, and a great debate about, about that. So uh, let's move to the next case um, by Olga. Can you stop sharing your screen, please, Ahmed? And Olga will, will present my hip replacement is very painful. Here is the bug. So Olga, you can share your screen and uh, present your, your case about this uh, septic loosening. Good okay. evening, everybody. Thank you for this kind introduction. And let us share the experience and algorithm what we use while uh, dealing with a septic uh, with an infection case. Um, so, um, it doesn't go. You cannot go forward? Mm -hmm. But it's your computer. Okay. It's your computer, yeah. so... No, it was okay. While you were doing that, maybe we can move to the next case. Uh, take, take, wait. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So there's yeah. a case as a woman of the 60 years old. And she uh, complains on a permanent uh, pain on her left hip and even uh, disturbs in the night, worsening out the physical activity. She doesn't have any fever. From the clinical side, we didn't find any signs of inflammation, but her hips movements were painful. And also she has got her um, uh, hip implant because of the uh, hip arthritis in uh, September 2000, uh, 2022. But the pain is getting worse after the, uh, after the rehabilitation period. The uh, wound healing was good without secretion and from a uh, concomitant disease, the part uh, of uh, her stays hip, she didn't have any uh, any uh, conditions which could affect uh, the cause of post-operative period. We excluded all other causes of uh, additional pain and also in uh, the dynamics we didn't find any signs of uh, loosening of implant. So uh, the patient has got twice the puncture of her hip joint, but the joint was okay. I mean, uh, uh, they did as the surgeons didn't find um, uh, fluid, and uh, the hip puncture was repeated in a, a hospital, and it was found the elevated number of the leukocyte count and the polymononuclear cells. And according to the European Bone and Joint Infection Society Point Foundation and Pro MSAS, uh, we have found that is a sign of infection. So that is those algorithms which we follow uh, when we're dealing with uh, um, such cases. So in this one was a chronic infection six uh, months after the primary hip implantation. And we thought about, we took a look at her uh, soft tissues, which were good. She didn't have any fistula. She didn't have multiple revisions on this hip. And we decided to go for the one stage exchange. But one of the crucial point, which is considered to be from uh, most of the um, well-established outstanding clinics, it's considered to be that we should know the pathogen preoperatively. In the clinic for experience we follow, it's um, from Berlin, it's considered to be there is no, it's good to know, but it's not like a crucial point that we have to. So that is uh, uh, mostly what we look at. It's a state of the soft tissues. It's a uh, uh, absence of the large uh, bone defects and also the number of the previous surgeries. 
So the um, one stage exchange was done, uh, and uh, we also used locally uh, calcium sulfate hydroxyapatite with additional combination of one comycin and gentamicin, which were put it into the femoral canal proximally. Uh, from there, uh, during the surgery, we uh, uh, repeated hip puncture before fascia open, which also um, showed us the elevated number of leukocyte count. Uh, for explanted implant was sent to the sonication. It was found staph epidermitis and also uh, from staph epidermis from tissue samples and also histopathology showed us periprostatic membrane time three. This patient went for the wide growth spectrum antibiotics in post-operative period for uh, ten, uh, 10 days that switched to the oral antibiotics with antibiotics activity which were followed for 12 weeks and she was successfully treatment treated and for the question which I would like to ask for the panel as for the would we go for the in this case for the one stage revision even if you know the data of the preoperative the pathogen Dr. American what do you think do you use this uh, option, one stage in this case, or or just to go, you know, more secure, two stages? Uh, I think in most cases, I still do two stage. And in some selected cases, uh, I was not sure what uh, what Pavizi's uh, opinion was. Uh, before, one of the dogmas is that if you're going to consider one stage, is that you need to know the organism, and it has to be a, a good uh, a organism which is sensitive. So in this case, it's Steph Epi. Uh, um, it's a gram positive. If it's uh, not multi-resistant, um, maybe tempted uh, to do it if the host is good. Um, but if I'm not so sure of the quality of the brightman, I might might still do a two stage. I, I'd like to to know the the, the opinion from India, uh, Mir Mirna, Mirna. What do you think about uh, doing one stage in this case? I mean, what do you prefer? actually? Mm, we know the bug here. But uh, in India, the consensus is everyone usually does a two-stage because uh, the patients are very immunocompromised. They have poor nutrition. They do not follow the instructions properly. And uh, they come very late with the sinuses and all, and the tissues are not good. So we usually recommend, and I always do a two-stage in my clinical practice. I would go for a two-stage. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you. I mean, Ahmed, what do you think? Cairo? Egypt, do you do the same to a stage or do you all, you know, more brave one stage? Yeah, in 99% uh, of the cases, we go for two stages. <laughs> <laughs> but you see one, that one, the of the, one of the bad things about going to stage, I and mean, when you put a cement spacer in, uh, some patients are really unreliable, just get lost to follow up. They just start working on the spacer and they come back with very bad established defects because of the cement. So, yeah, I guess you can't win sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, but I mean... I, yeah, yeah let, let me ask Mark one, one minute. Mark, from Spain, I think we here in Spain, we are more, you know, trying to, to do to a stage, right? Well, I think that that's, uh, that doesn't depend on what do you as a person, as an individual surgeon think, but it depends on which team are you involved with. So it depends on the hospital where you depends on how much you trust your infectious team. It depends on the lab. It depends on a lot of things. So the more you have uh, a team specialized in septics, the more you can do one stage. But yeah. if you are in a hospital where you don't really know who is your team, then it's better to go to a two stage. That's my opinion. As a single yeah, surgeon, I can go one stage. Point. Sorry, Olga, what do you say? I, I mean, it's a very important point that uh, Mark mentioned about the, uh, the presence of the support from uh, and the cooperation of the uh, team from infection side team. Sebastian, you work in the same hospital as Olga, so your, your thoughts are the same, right? Yeah, it's for me the perfect case where we do nowadays uh, one stage exchange because uh, <laughs> No big bone defect. Um, uh, it's uh, no previous or many previous surgeries before. So um, the soft tissue is good. It's for me the perfect case, and it's. I think it's not necessary. And I hope in uh, in a few years the the rest of 
uh, you will do one stage exchange <laughs> in these cases. And you hear okay. even now with the culture negative cases, they are going to the one stage exchange. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's take the, the point from Sebastian and I will do the replay of this webinar in five years. See <laughs> what people say about that, okay? So Olga, can you go to the end of the of the case? Yes, because we are running. Oh, time, this so. is the end of the case. Ah, is, is the end? Okay, great. Yeah. So fantastic. Yeah. You are we on tried time. It successfully, yeah. I, I want to be like you when I uh, get older. I mean, <laughs> so precise and, and on time. So thank you so much, Olga, for this fantastic case and, and the great discussion. And let's move to the last case from Marte. Yeah, he will present uh, my total hip replacement is dislocated again. Was it my fault? I mean, this is a, a great thinking from every one of us when we saw a dislocated hip in the in the emergency room or they ask us. So Mark, go ahead, please. You're mute. You're mute, Mark. Your microphone is mute. Yes. So, no. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Yes, that is the... Uh, the case that I'm going to present. So this is a male, 67 years old, uh, allergic to penicillin and hypertension and some problems related to, to an infarctal uh, myocardius and congestive heart failure. And in 2005, he had a total hip replacement due to osteoarthritis. They did a uh, united with polyethylene with metal by posterior approach with no incidence reported. That was in 2005. And this is the X-ray in 2000, uh, and it's the first uh, X-ray that we have. Uh, the patient was going well until nine years later when he started with groin and lateral pain. Uh, he needed a cane. Uh, it was studied as infection was excluded um, and there were no other um, causes of that uh, pain, but they saw that polyethylene was, so they decided to do um, a polyethylation revision. In the 5th of March in 2015, uh, by posterior approach, it was uh, revised the polyethylene, as you can see in the tip ray, and uh, some days later, he did uh, a, a posterior dislocation that was well reduced, but uh, four days later, a new uh, a second case of dislocation also reduced. And several days later, a third one uh, reduced and a fourth one reduced. Um, so finally, uh, it was decided that there was uh, um, something to do. And uh, after excluding um, it was revised the uh, the acetabulum, it was by the same uh, approach, posterior approach, and using a constrained linear. Um, that was May 2015. And the patient went well. Um, this is in 2017, and it was revised every year. Um, but in March uh, 2023, uh, he had a new dislocation. Uh, it was an attempt to do a close reduction, of course, with the uh, constrained linear, it, that was not possible. Uh, so they did um, um, third surgery, and it was uh, the, the 21 of March in 2023 with a posterior approach again, and they did a uh, triple constrained linear, as you can see. Um, and at the moment, uh, the patient it's okay, but. Um, the history of that patient, uh, we are not sure about that. So, um, in summary, it's uh, a total hip replacement with a, a big amount of dislocation after revision of the linear. Uh, it has had also dislocations after, after constraint of linear. Uh, any sign of infection, analytics, sample culture, sonication. It was controlled at the septic unit and all the sonications and everything was negative. So um, my doubts for the discussion for the panel, it's um, could the sacral slope assessment change the history? I mean, do we have to adapt um, in revisions or after um, initial dislocations uh, and 
we have to take in account the the sacral slope in order to uh, is femoral stem antiration something we should consider um some uh, femoral stem seems seems good in that it's right but of course it's not a good way to to have a, a real position of the femoral stem so should we uh, consider this are all the constrained linears really constrained? Is double mobility going to stop this kind of histories? How we should manage soft tissues after repeated dislocation episodes? That means uh, the external rotations, it's impossible to be repaired. We should do any kind of um, plastic with gluteus maximus or something in order to avoid those. Those are my questions for the panel. Wow, Mark. Too many questions, right? And we have only three minutes to to, to answer that. So, uh, 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 Professor American, your time. I mean, this is your topic. Um, uh, I mean, is there any common that you start this tremendous story with a simple liner revision? Yes. Um... Yeah, you have to be careful. So the older the patient is, I think, and especially females, and if they have any back problems or any surgery to the spine, and, and there I, I just, from one of the images, I saw some uh, spondylotic changes in the lower lumbar spine. So if there's a possibility of, um, and some of the pictures, I'm not sure whether they're standing up or they're lying down, but you have a rough idea of the shape of the pelvic brim. So some of those pictures, it looks as if the, the pelvis is unusually tilted. Uh, it, it, it looks as if the pelvis is tilted forwards. You know, the pelvic brim looks more that shape rather than than round. So I, I'm not sure whether he has stiff spine. Uh, the femoral stem and diversion should be quite easily uh, measured on CT scans. And also intra up on a posterior approach, you've got the tibia, so you can have a look at uh, the, the version that way. And I have, I have been called out where... Uh, the previous surgeon has put very much uh, of antiversion in the stem and it never dislocated until I went to revise the liner. Uh, and then it kept on dislocating and then I have to revise the stem. Um, but the stem antiversion, uh, I guess if during operation you find that stem antiversion is excessive, um, one option is to revise the stem, but that may be not practical. Um, but you might want to reduce the, the cup version in, in that situation. But uh, after it dislocated so many times, I think I would do a, a, a proper assessment by doing the CT and find out what is the stem version and the stem uh, and the cup version. Um, if you look at the some of the X-rays, the, the cup looks uh, like a, a straight-on shot, so it's not a like a, oblique. So I think there's not much version on, on the cup. So that there's a possibility, but the pelvis may be tilted. Um, okay. I but, think but remember, uh, sometimes the external rotators may not be able to be repaired, especially when you increase offset. I, I'm not sure whether that's really that important, but yeah, I've, I have reconstructed uh, external rotators with the gluteus max, but in, in some revisions, actually, I, I didn't repair them and they seem to be quite stable as long as, you know, during the surgery, you got the, the lateral shock. Uh, here, I think uh, my experience with the tripolar uh, constraint liners have been better than, than the other one that you showed. Uh, I've I've had both, but the thing about the tripolar constraint liners is it, it's got like a dual mobility within the constraint and it also increases the offset as opposed to the other one, uh, the Zimmer one, where it's just more like a a, a grip onto the onto the head. So yeah, okay, that's Sebastian. Thoughts. Yeah, Sebastian, uh, do, do oh, you have this case? Dual mobility, I, I think it may not be able to sort out some problems because dual mobility just gives you more range of motion, but if your lateral shock is very loose, uh, the dual mobility may not be able to help you. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, uh, do you have this kind of cases that start with a simple uh, liner exchange and, and start this problem with instability? Or do you think that this surgery should be, uh, you know, be planned before very carefully? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it depends really on this on the cases, but I think well, we have seen these cases where it's just the liner exchange and then you have the problem because of the soft tissue often. So in, in these cases where we have uh, repeat uh, dislocations, I would uh, go for the for all we, we, we have nearly. So the CT scan just to, to check the anti-version of the femoral stem, as uh, the colleague says, uh, the, the version of the cup seems to be very, very low. Um, 
And um, I would do also an MRI scan just to, to see uh, what about the muscles, um, because I think it sometimes, but not in this cases or in, in cases where you have repeated revisions, we see really, really bad soft tissues. Um, and then it's, uh, or it could be also a big problem. And then we think about to repair it, uh, like about a, a white side plastic or stuff like this. And you, you have to combine these, these things. So it's, uh, um, uh, perhaps you have to, to go for a dual, dual mobility cup then and, uh, um, try to, um, repair the soft tissue as, as much as possible. So it's important the ro the role of soft tissues, but um, a quick replay for and um, question for for uh, everyone. I mean, Ahmed, are you a fan? When do you use constraint liners? Just a quick replay. When do you use that? Are you a fan of constraint liners? Uh, actually, I never use uh, constraint liners. Uh, my, my 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 upper end is a dual mobility cup. Okay, Mirna. Yeah, I would use a constraint liner only if there is abducted deficiency. Otherwise, I would prefer using a dual mobility. Olga? From my side, also for the dual mobility and constraint liner, I'm not so worried. No? Okay, Mark? So we use um, constraint liners mainly when you have a, a problem related to instability. When you suspect that you will have a problem related to instability, then you use double mobility. But when you really have the problem related to instability, I think it's not enough. Okay, American? Oh, I think, yeah, it, it is really a bailout situation. So you will use it when you have to, and in the elderly, low demand, and particularly when the ab uh, there's some sort of abductor dysfunction, that's when I would use a constraint liner. Sebastian, when do you use constraint liners? Also, just in a few cases. I'm uh, not a big fan when uh, in older people, low demand, um, and then perhaps not in the primary situation or never in a primary situation because we saw these cases where the constraint and the cup uh, is getting out uh, because it's not stable enough. So in this case, when the cup is uh, well fixed, sometimes we have used these, um, uh, but it's really the last uh, chance we, we we have then okay thank you guys the the time is running so fast i'm sorry because we will continue discussion for a couple of hours more <laughs> with cases this is so so enjoyable a situation for 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 the the people who, who who do this hip replacement to discuss about cases especially the case are not yours um and then uh, thank you so much everyone for uh, the discussion and staying here and um, I hope the audience uh, have enjoyed a lot with that. And finally, I would like to say thank you to all the HIP subcommittee and, and also Sufian for all your uh, support to, to our webinars. And uh, please uh, keep this QR and, and, and take a picture of that because if you want to get your certificate of attendance, you need to fill in the survey that you will have after this, uh, this uh, QR. So there are many other webinars coming from Seacord Pioneer, like you have here. And, uh, and for sure, I hope you will be with us in Cairo next month and enjoy this fantastic country and enjoy Seacord uh, knowledge. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope to see you soon. Bye.